The National Desk, America's News, now. The collapse of the key bridge is a global crisis. Complicated cleanup. The investigation in Baltimore enters a new phase, shifting from recovery mission to risky salvage operation. This is our our typical scene for these types of hearings, um, and I think it's important for everyone to have their voice heard. The monumental case over abortion pill access, why the Supreme Court seems skeptical, and how it could impact other drugs. Plus, taming inflation, the Fed expected to lower interest rates sometime this year. My chairman Jerome Powell won't say when. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Dee Dee Gatton. Thanks for being here with us. On this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week, and we look ahead at what to expect, starting with the four big stories we've been following this week. Unfair advantage, Apple, Meta, and Alphabet all under investigation. What the EU probe could mean for the future of big tech. Majority mix-up, the GOP's hold in the House now in jeopardy after several members retire earlier than expected. Split on strategy, a potential ground invasion in Rafah, dividing the U.S. and Israel when both countries are set to meet. But first, the bridge collapse in Baltimore with impacts felt across the country. Governor Wes Moore says officials are moving forward on four key priorities following the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Moore says authorities continue to focus on recovery in order to bring a sense of closure to the families who lost loved ones. The next priority is opening the channel and restarting traffic to the port. Third is taking care of everyone affected by the crisis. And that means the families, that means the workers, that means the businesses, that means the first responders. That means everybody. And we are going to make sure that in this moment, we take care of our people. And Moore says officials are going to focus on rebuilding the bridge. He emphasizes it will be a long road ahead, but that authorities are well prepared. One group immediately affected by the poor blockage is the workers who load and manage the ships coming in and out of the harbor. The National Desk, Rebecca Pryor, talked to some of those workers as the bridge collapse puts them in a difficult situation. It started like any other shift. I ended up working uh, 15 hours on that vessel driving the crane. Crane operator Damon Tucker working from above, arranging and placing cargo loads onto a 10,000 container vessel, a job he's done for more than two decades. Many times I drive those cranes, um, I'm watching the ships go underneath the bridge. I always wonder what would happen if one of those ships collided with the bridge. But he never imagined one crash. Oh! would bring the entire bridge crumbling down. I had tears in my eyes. Potentially taking his livelihood along with it. I knew right away that this was catastrophic. The collapse cutting off sea traffic to one of the nation's busiest ports indefinitely, a port that employs more than 15,000 people with direct jobs. Buying hourly laborers some time, Tucker says trucks are still transporting goods in and out, but once the last container is shipped. We have no more work. How soon until that happens? I, I want to say maybe a week. As lawmakers move fast to draft legislation that would guarantee pay for at least 40 hours a week. Many of us longshoremen live paycheck to paycheck like many other people in this economy. We have to work 60 and 70, 80 hours a week, a week to make a decent living. The clock now ticking for these workers and their families, many of them already struggling to stay financially afloat. So we have no idea how we're going to make it from week to week because we depend on our check every Friday. And that was Rebecca Pryor reporting. Tucker says an emergency meeting is scheduled for Monday with port leadership where they're hoping to get more concrete answers on what, if any, compensation they'll be provided. Stay with us for continuing coverage of the Baltimore Bridge collapse throughout our newscast. And remember, you can always find updates and additional headlines at thenationaldesk.com. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has agreed to reschedule his delegation's visit to the White House. Netanyahu could cancel a trip that was scheduled for last Monday. So we're, we're uh, now working uh, with them to set to find a convenient date uh, that's obviously going to work for both sides. But he, his office has agreed uh, to, uh, to reschedule that meeting that would be dedicated uh, to Rafa, which is a good thing. President Biden requested the visit to share U.S. concerns about a potential military operation in Rafah. 
The administration is concerned a ground invasion would put innocent civilians in danger and disrupt the flow of humanitarian aid. Investors are expecting the Federal Reserve to cut interest rates three times this year starting in June, but the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta is more wary. According to Bloomberg, he actually anticipates only one rate cut this year. Meantime, Fed Chair Jerome Powell has yet to even commit to bringing down rates. The committee wants to see uh, more data that gives us higher confidence that inflation is moving down sustainably toward 2 percent. I also mentioned uh, and we don't see this in, in the data right now, but if there were a significant weakening in the data, particularly in the labor market, that could also be a reason for us to, to begin the process of reducing rates again. Some on Wall Street have interpreted those comments to mean rates could start coming down regardless if the Fed hits its 2 percent target rate. Inflation is currently hovering around 3 percent. Over on Capitol Hill, there is a major shakeup for House Republicans. Members who are planning to retire next year are now leaving office early. That includes Congressman Ken Buck and Mike Gallagher. The move is putting the GOP's majority in serious jeopardy. I'm pleading with Mike Gallagher, please leave early enough so that we can have a special election to win this safe Republican seat that he currently sits in so that we can retain that majority. It is it is going to be disastrous for this country if we lose the majority at this point right now. Fox News reports other Republicans in the House are also considering leaving early. If more retirements are announced, House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries could be House Speaker before November. U.S. Capitol Police arrested 13 protesters Tuesday, demonstrating the Supreme Court's examination of restrictions on the abortion pill Mifepristone. Officers said they were illegally blocking roads and walkways on the Capitol grounds. The justices weighing the biggest abortion case since it overturned Roe v. Wade. The National Desk, Kayla Gaskins reports. The country, Demonstrations taking place outside the Supreme Court Tuesday. Abortion is health care. As the justices sat inside. Hearing oral arguments regarding restricted access to one of the most popular abortion pills, Mifeprestone that's now used in roughly two-thirds of all abortions in the U.S. This is our, our typical scene for these types of hearings, um, and I think it's important for everyone to have their voice heard. Banning the pill is not expected to be on the table. We are not going to let our personal bodily autonomy, our personal medical decisions, be decided by extreme judges. Conservative lawmakers are asking the high court to roll back rules the FDA put in place expanding access such as allowing the pill to be prescribed through telehealth appointments and then mailed to patients. Another issue is the FDA allowing patients to take the pill in the first 10 weeks of pregnancy instead of the originally approved seven weeks. Which I desperately wanted. Pro-life activists say these changes endanger women. Well, this case is about reinstating the original regulations about the abortion pill. So at the very least, it would prevent situations like we've seen of women walking into our clinics hemorrhaging because no one told them what would happen. The White House and abortion rights advocates argue those claims are too speculative to have legal sway. Things politicians should keep their mouths shut. The Biden administration also argues overriding the FDA's judgment to regulate the abortion pill would open a floodgate of other lawsuits targeting controversial medications, including contraception, gender-affirming care drugs, and COVID-19 vaccines. A decision in this case is expected to come down in June, and it could shake up the 2024 election cycle as Democrats push to make protecting abortion access a key issue up and down the ballot. Reporting outside the Supreme Court, I'm Kayla Gaskins for the National Desk, America's News Now. Democrats won an investigation into former President Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, given new reports regarding his push for overseas business deals. Top House Democrats are asking Republicans for a hearing on Kushner and his push for financial arrangements in Serbia. This as the GOP looks towards legislation restricting such activity of the family members of presidents. Republicans have been investigating Biden and his alleged role in his son's foreign business work. They produced no evidence of illegality, and Biden says he's done nothing wrong. Sam Bankman Fried, the founder of cryptocurrency exchange FTX, was sentenced to 25 years in prison on Thursday. He was convicted in November on fraud and conspiracy charges after FTX's collapse. The judge determined SBF could do something criminal in the future and that he posed a risk to others. 
Prosecutors say he cost customers and investors $10 billion in a quest to fuel his rise in the budding crypto industry. The judge recommended he be placed in a low security prison. The EU just announced non-compliance investigations into Apple, Meta, and Alphabet under the new Digital Markets Act. I'm back with Courtney from the Fact Check team, and this is just the latest efforts by the EU to crack down on big tech. That's right, we have seen this before, and here are a few examples. Earlier this month, the EU imposed its first antitrust penalty against Apple, nearly $2 billion, for unfairly favoring its own music streaming service. The platform said it will appeal the decision. The EU has also hit Google with several fines, including a record $5 billion one in 2018 over its Android software, which it was able to reduce but wasn't able to overturn, and another $2.7 billion one the year before for favoring its shopping service over competitors, which the platform said it expects to pay. And big tech is also facing scrutiny here in the U.S. What's the latest on that? Right, so the DOJ just filed an antitrust lawsuit against Apple last week, accusing the platform of illegally maintaining a monopoly over the smartphone market. The complaint the complaint specifically alleges that Apple violated Section 2 of the Sherman Antitrust Act, which makes monopolization a felony. All right, there is much more. Courtney, thank you for that. For more on this fact team topic, including links to their sources, scan the QR code on your screen or visit thenationaldesk.com. Just ahead, government shutdown averted what the new spending bill means for homeland security and conditions at the southern border. Plus, NBC in the hot seat, what its removal of Ronna McDaniel could mean for the future of the network. Last week, President Biden signed a spending bill passed by Congress averting a government shutdown. Joining Angela Brown to discuss the broader and border impact is former acting head of Customs and Border Protection, Mark Morgan. You know, I want to start with that Sunday interview with um, the Border Patrol chief. And it was really a stunning interview. It's rare that we get to hear from someone from the Border Patrol like that in one-on-one. -on -one. And the one thing he said, keeping him up at night, is 140,000 gotaways in this country. We don't know where they are or who they are. You have talked about this issue at nausea many times. But to hear from someone at Border Patrol, it really put it in perspective, Mark. And it should have, and it should keep the president and Congress up at night as well. And keep in mind, the 140,000 known gotaways he talked about was just the first five months in this fiscal year. The past 38 months under this president, that totals actually close to 2 million known gotaways. Uh, there are 15 states in this country whose population is less than 2 million. We've literally added the equivalent of, of a 51st state of gotaways. Uh, what that means is every single day, the reality is that criminals are evading apprehension and they're making the way into this country. Murderers, rapists, pedophiles, aggravated felons and gang members. What it also means is potential national security threats are evading apprehension and making the way in this country. That, that came from countries that we know sponsor and harbor and facilitate terrorism. Yet once again, Congress failed the American people and they failed to pass any meaningful border security uh, changes in policy that would end the chaos and lawlessness at our border. And you used the word meaningful just a few seconds ago. Let's talk about that $1.2 trillion spending package. You obviously don't believe that was meaningful, um, just based on what you said. I know a part of that package is something like it will pay for 2,000 uh, border agents. Is that not enough? What, do you th what is your takeaway from that package and those but, uh, agents? Yeah. Uh, unequivocally, my answer is no. You're not going to solve the chaos and lawlessness on our border by throwing more money and resources at it only. It's going to take significant policy change. It's going to take this president taking the same pen that he used to enact 94 executive orders that dismantled and destroyed a network of policies we had that intentionally unsecured the border to reinstate those policies. That's what it's going to take. And right now, once again, as I said, Congress failed. And I'm really frustrated at Speaker Johnson 
Uh, he had a chance here. He had a chance to stand up. Just a few weeks ago, he was talking tough about holding the line with respect to HR2, that the strongest piece of border security legislation that's ever been passed 10 months ago. It actually provided that policy pathway forward that I'm talking about. And he was so strong, it, 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 in part, it, that's why the Lankford bill uh, crashed and burned as it should have. And then uh, all of a sudden now, he just passed the $1.2 trillion that is actually does less than the Lankford bill would have done. Now, you just mentioned Speaker Johnson. I know you said you're upset with him. So what do you think about that whole move by Marjorie Taylor Greene to possibly oust him for Speaker? It's just a motion, no teeth to it. But what do you think of that? Look, I, I understand the frustration, because keep in mind, uh, uh, H.R. 2 that I talked about, that was actually passed under McCarthy. It's the strongest piece of border security legislation that's ever been passed. It is, truly was a meaningful policy path forward. And, and uh, uh, Speaker Johnson, he walked away from all of that. And so right now, uh, like for example, the, the issues that led, the policies that led to the death of Lincoln Riley, this $1.2 trillion uh, uh, dollar omnibus, would have, is, will do nothing to prevent the death of the next Lake and Riley. And I want to talk really quickly about this one key amendment with the Lake and um, Riley Act that would require the Department of Homeland Security to detain undocumented immigrants who commit criminal offenses such as theft and burglary. Um, right now, would this be enough? Is this a good tool, you think, in terms of for ICE to detain and deport um, criminal migrants? First of all, it doesn't go far enough. I, I go back to HR2, but it's a step in the right direction because it really goes to the heart of what really led to Lake and Riley's death, and that's the absurd laws of sanctuary cities. It had had, in, had uh, uh, the New York NYPD been allowed to work with law enforcement and had Secretary Mayorkas not limited ICE's law enforcement capability and authorities, uh, it would have prevented the death of Lake and Riley. And what the Democrats did by pushing this down is they've told every Everybody in this country that you can be here illegally, you commit another crime, and we're okay with you being released into the interior of the United States to yet claim another victim and potentially another Lake and Riley. And thanks for your time, former Acting Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection and fellow at the Heritage Foundation, Mark Morgan. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, good morning. NBC is getting heat for firing their newest commentator, former RNC chair Ronna McDaniel. Critics are accusing the network of a double standard and being biased against pro-Trump voices. National correspondent Janae Bowens unwraps the backlash. Let's give it up to Vicky. Former RNC chair Ronna McDaniel is considering suing NBC after the network fired her as a political commentator following backlash from their employees. They are going to sue for the destruction of her business opportunities that come from being on TV. I think they made a terrible decision and they allowed the MSNBC bleed to take over their network. Now this has reignited claims that the mainstream media has a double standard against conservatives. God forbid yeah. they have one dissenting voice in their entire network. This is a form of tyranny where you don't have freedom of speech, you don't have contrasting right. viewpoints. The hypocrisy reeks. You make such a huge mistake when you limit who you talk to to being the people who already agree with you. And some media experts agree there is an issue of fairness. Their reaction to uh, uh, Ronna McDaniel is really outrageous. I mean, there's no reason that she can't be a regular on uh, to represent a conservative point of view. NBC News executives reacted to their hosts questioning McDaniel's credibility. Many of our professional dealings with the RNC over the last six years have been met with gaslighting. I understand yeah. the motivation, yeah. but this execution, I think, was poor. The fact that Ms. McDaniel is on the payroll at NBC News, to me, that is inexplicable. Many now speculating how the fallout will impact NBC. You have to decide when you've got a news operation whether it's going to be news or whether it's going to be propaganda. The cult has taken over the news division, and it's going to hurt the 74 million people who voted for Donald Trump are not going to watch NBC News. According to Politico, McDaniel expects to be fully compensated for her contract, a total of $600,000. In Washington, I'm Janae Bowens for The National Desk. Coming up next here on The National Desk, gun trafficking cracked down the shade with new laws on reporting firearm thefts. Plus, heading towards the border, new concerns in Florida over resources available to vet Haitian migrants.
The National Desk Team of Reporters is bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America, and we start in Seattle, Washington, where Governor Jay Inslee officially signed a bill into law requiring gun owners to report stolen firearms within 24 hours or face a steep fine. Up until now, gun owners have had five days to report the theft of a firearm, but with this bill's passage, that deadline will now only be 24 hours, or a gun owner could be fined. This is before the trail gets cold, and this gives law enforcement the tools to investigate and identify patterns of gun trafficking. The suggestion that that's going to do something to curb crime uh, is just nonsense. Several gun rights organizations, including the NRA and the Second Amendment Foundation, were quick to push back against this new law, saying it unfairly targets law-abiding gun owners. We're talking about somebody who has already suffered a crime, uh, you know, a felony crime, and now he's facing a, a potential fine. This new law comes as stolen guns flood Seattle streets. In fact, SPD says more stolen guns were recovered last year than ever before. In Texas, concerns growing as violence escalates in Haiti. Displaced people could be heading towards the southern border. Experts say not all migrants are looking for a safer life in the U.S., and there's always uncertainty about who is coming to the border. The people coming into San Antonio, we do not know any other criminal history because there's no relationship now. There's nobody at the helm of the government of Haiti. In a statement, CBP said they have surged resources to the southern border, but changing migration patterns impact the immigration system no matter what. In North Carolina, the start of the spring season means bear sightings are on the rise. Bear experts say it's typical to see bears roaming looking for food. So you're probably going to see uh, what they call yearling bears, bears that were cubs last year. They're going to be a little bit bigger now. They're going to be probably somewhere in the neighborhood of, of a few hundred pounds out looking for their own territories. Bears in western North Carolina don't go into full hibernation like those in much colder climates. Still ahead, Disney dropping its fight against Governor Ron DeSantis, who will have control over the Orlando district after a new case settlement. A consumer alert from Subaru. The automaker is recalling 120,000 Outback and Legacy vehicles over potentially faulty airbag sensors. The recall impacts the 2020 through 2022 model years. If you look at your screen here, according to Subaru, the sensor that detects passengers could crack and short circuit, preventing the airbag from deploying during a crash. Impacted owners will be notified by mail and dealers will replace the part for free. Take a look at the top trending stories on our website right now. Disney had dropped its fight with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis over control of the district that contains Disney World. Going forward, Disney and a DeSantis-appointed board will have to agree on plans for its growth. The Federal Trade Commission is investigating TikTok over its data and security practices. The platform is already fighting a potential U.S. ban if it doesn't break ties with its China-based owner. Texas is looking to secure its future in space exploration. According to an announcement from Governor Greg Abbott this week, the state will host the launch pad for NASA's future missions to Mars. Those stories and much more available right now at thenationaldesk.com. Want to feel younger? You need to get a good night's sleep. Easier said than done, right? But researchers actually found not getting enough sleep could make you feel five to 10 years older. They looked at a couple, a group of people between the ages of 18 and 70 years old, and the group was allowed no more than four hours of sleep. On average, they felt nearly four and a half years older than they really were. 
Researchers say that's due to a lack of energy and motivation. Losing sleep also limits physical and social activity. Ahead in our next half hour, swipe fee fight new regulations that could lower costs for businesses and possibly consumers. Plus, following the money, why convicted killer Alex Murdoch could have a plea deal revoked in the case over stolen client funds. You're watching the National Desk America's News now. You can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time and anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back. The National Desk, America's News, now. The Federal Election Commission is completely falling down on the job and leaving us terribly vulnerable. AI warning, intensifying calls for more regulation of artificial intelligence in the middle of a polarizing election season. Plus supply chain concerns, how the catastrophic bridge collapse in Baltimore could impact the U.S. economy. And later, taming tailpipe emissions, how new regulations could impact gas vehicles. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Dee Dee Gatton, and the next few months will bring us fully into the throngs of the 2024 election campaign. But this year will be like no other, with warnings artificial intelligence could be a major threat, including in the days just before Americans head to the polls in November. Here's national correspondent Christine Frizzell. The landscape is changing with new warnings about artificial intelligence and our democracy. It's one of my areas of greatest concern, the, 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 the more general ability of these models to manipulate, to persuade. Industry leaders acknowledge deep fake audio has become indistinguishable from real people's voices with this example of how it presents a danger with a voice impersonating the president discouraging people from voting in New Hampshire's primary. It's important that you save your vote for the November election. Voting this Tuesday only enables the Republicans in their quest to elect Donald Trump again. The Federal Communications Commission has now banned deepfake robocalls, and the Federal Trade Commission has proposed a ban on impersonation of individuals in government and business. But despite those actions by the FCC and the FTC, Rob Weissman, president of Public Citizen, says the FEC needs to do much more. The Federal Election Commission is completely falling down on the job and leaving us terribly vulnerable in the 2024 election cycle. He says on a positive note, many states have taken action. The Georgia House last month passed a bill making it a felony to use deceptive video or audio to impersonate candidates. How can we have election integrity without knowing what the candidates are saying and what they're truthfully saying, what they truthfully believe in? YouTube now requires labels for some AI-generated content, with similar policies from Meta, which owns Facebook and Instagram. But concerns are rising that bad actors will simply not follow those policies. If you're a candidate and you're portrayed two days before the election in a video falling down drunk, you're in a lot of trouble. And to get up and tell people that wasn't me, that's going to be a hard sell because people will have seen it with their own eyes. One of the greatest concerns, that things could get so out of control that people don't trust anything they see or hear. And that lack of trust 
could undermine American democracy for years to come. I'm Christine Frizzell for the National Desk. Former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie has decided against a no labels run for president. He tells The Washington Post he believes there is no pathway to win the White House through a third party. This leaves the no labels group with few remaining alternatives. Many of the candidates approached for the ticket have also publicly ruled out a run, including Senator Joe Manchin and former Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, who's now running for Senate. A Tennessee congressman is being sued for defamation for a post he made on X. The lawsuit claims Representative Tim Burchett falsely identified a Kansas man as a Chiefs Parade shooter and a legal alien. Burchett deleted the post and admitted that the man was not an undocumented migrant, but he still suggested he was one of the shooters. The plaintiff is seeking $75,000 for mental distress and death threats because of the post. Federal prosecutors are trying to revoke a plea deal made with convicted killer Alex Murdoch. Murdoch pleaded guilty to stealing money from clients in exchange for a 27 year sentence as long as he submitted a polygraph test. According to the FBI, Murdoch failed the test, lying about where the money went and who helped him steal it. He's already serving a life sentence for the murders of his wife and son. The DOJ is suing Apple, accusing the company of being a monopoly and harming customers by driving up costs. Joining Angela Brown to discuss this and more is former White House economic advisor Steve Moore. But first, let's talk about uh, the key bridge collapse in um, Baltimore and what yep. the global impact is going to have. When you look at the numbers, they're really just jaw dropping here. 52.3 million tons of car foreign cargo going through this port worth $80 billion. How are we going to feel it? How is the economy going to feel this? Well, it's a supply chain issue. Remember that term from mm -hmm. after COVID where uh, it turns out the Baltimore port is a major hub for international commerce, especially here in the United States. Uh, an, an amazing amount of cargo goes through that, uh, uh, that port, uh, which will now be closed down for we don't know how long, but it's going to be weeks probably months to rebuild this and so that will have a ne very negative impact on the economy no question about it angela um i've seen estimates that just for the baltimore area alone this is going to cost about 10 million dollars a day uh that that uh that port is essentially shut down so i think it could have a very major impact but hopefully it will only be temporary i mean we've got to make sure that we get this bridge rebuilt as quickly as possible. The president has made that pledge that he's going to get that done, but we will see. We have to make sure that it gets done uh, as quickly as possible or it'll, it'll affect prices. You know, the prices that we pay Absolutely. if you can't get the cargo through. And that's what people are worried about at home because we've already gone through a supply chain crunch and how it drove prices up in so many different areas and people are worried about that now. Do you think some of these mitigating efforts like diverting uh, to other ports will, will make a big difference here? Say that again, Will, what? Do you think some of these efforts that some um, are suggesting, like uh, the governor of Virginia using the port of yeah, Virginia sure, Norfolk, sure, these sure. mitigating efforts will make a difference yeah. in terms of kind of making sure everything can go through these, uh, su the supplies can actually move out? Sure. I mean, some obviously some of the uh, cargo is going to have to be relocated to other ports along the East Coast there. And you're right, Virginia is another one. But it's going to take some time for that mm -hmm. adjustment to be made and I do think you're going to see prices take a bit of a hit, especially if you live in that area. By the way, I live in the Washington, D.C. area, not too far from Baltimore. And you're also just going to have, you know, remember that corridor yeah. along the Northeast Corridor is one of the busiest highways for trucking, for cars. And so now that that bridge is shut down, it's going to cause snarl traffic for many months in the Baltimore area. There's already a headache for a lot of drivers. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, let's talk about the Apple lawsuit right here. Um, the Justice Department said in a release to keep consumers buying iPhones, Apple moved to block cross pa um, platform messaging apps, limit third party wallet and smart uh, capabilities, smartwatch capabilities, among other things. Now, you said you mentioned that this lawsuit is misguided. Why that word? Why is it misguided? Well, because, look, the, you know, I've. I, been, um, I'm a little older than you are, Angela, but I remember when uh, cell phones, as you can see on this uh, picture, you know, we were first invented. I remember the first Motorola 
uh, cell phone, which was uh, big, like a big brick, and didn't get nearly the kind of uh, services you get now. It didn't have streaming. It didn't mm -hmm. have the weather. It didn't have you know all of the uh, apps and so on. And Apple has done a great service to the country and the world by inventing this amazing device that all of us have, uh, at least uh, have a smartphone, it might not be an Apple. But the idea that they're a monopoly, I think is outrageous. I mean, for the last 30 years, the cost of the uh, iPhone has continued to go down and down and down and down. Now it's affordable to just about everybody. When you know when the when these phones first came out 30 years ago, it was only the very rich people who could afford to have a cell phone. So right. I think you know monopolies are supposed to be things that raise prices, but it, all Apple has been doing is providing better services and lowering costs for you know for decades. I don't see how that's a monopoly. You know I think that's like kind of a running theme we're having this morning because when you think about the consumer at home, when we see a lawsuit like this, we're worried about a lot of consumers. Will this lead to a price increase? Will you be paying more for that a a Apple iPhone? What do you think? How could this impact prices if this goes any further? Well, look, it just reduces innovation. And while you're seeing in the cell phone business, I'm all in favor of competition, but there is competition. There are, you know, many different cell phones. It, my problem with this, Angela, is it's almost like iPhone at Apple is being punished for building a better mousetrap. You know, they've got a great product. People like it. You know, leave it alone. <laughs> And you can view the full interview plus more top stories online all the time at thenationaldesk.com. Checking in on your money, a new antitrust settlement could save merchants money and possibly mean lower costs for consumers. Visa and MasterCard have agreed to lower swipe fees, which merchants pay when consumers make purchases. Typically, swipe fees cost merchants 2 to 4 percent of the total transaction. The settlement would lower those fees by at least 0.04 percent for a minimum of three years. Right now, Wells Fargo is being accused of overcharging deployed military members in a new lawsuit filed in North Carolina. According to local reporting, the bank is accused of violating the Service Members Civil Relief Act, which includes reducing the interest rate on any pre-service loans to a maximum of 6%. The lawsuit says Wells Fargo illegally charged higher interest rates. They issued the following statement to WCNC Charlotte, saying in part, they're committed to supporting all military service members and are reviewing details of the complaint. The FDA has granted emergency use authorization for a drug that will help keep high-risk patients from getting COVID-19. Pem Garda is an antibody infusion for immunocompromised people aged 12 and older. You can get it as often as every three months. The drug is not intended to treat people who have COVID. In fact, you can't take it if you currently have the virus or were recently exposed to it. It's expected to be available in the next two weeks and will likely be covered by insurance. The Biden administration released a new rule requiring car makers to cut the emissions of new vehicles by nearly 50 percent. I'm with Courtney from the fact check team and this is the latest on the federal level mm -hmm. but we understand states are also taking their own initiatives when it comes to gas cars. They are in fact at least eight states plan to ban the sale of new gas cars after 2035. It started with California back in 2022 where 35 percent of new car sales need to be zero emission by 2026, 68 percent by 2030 and 100% by 2035. And under Section 177 of the Clean Air Act, states can either follow federal standards or adopt California's stricter ones. 17 states have followed all or part of California's regulations, but so far only the states on your screen announced they'll enforce the advanced Clean Cars 2 rule. And what does this mean for the many people who drive gas cars? So if you already drive a gas car, you won't have to stop driving it or get rid of it, and you can even still buy used gas cars. The rule really just bans manufacturers and dealerships from selling new ones, which will ultimately pressure companies to ramp up production of zero emission cars and phase out production of gas ones. All right, Courtney, thank you. And for more on this Factor Team topic, including links to their sources, scan the QR code on your screen or visit thenationaldesk.com. Researchers are warning people to be mindful if they're driving on Eclipse Day, April 8th. During the last total solar eclipse in 2017, there was a brief surge in traffic accidents. According to the journal JAMA Internal Medicine, traffic risks increased 31%. That's an average of one extra crash every 25 minutes and one extra crash fatality 
every 95 minutes. About 20 million people travel to another city to view the eclipse. So to come, our team of correspondents breaks down this week in Washington from the terrorist threat at the border to a spike in gas prices and the fight against inflation. Welcome back. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day, reporting on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. Our team of correspondents is here to share their insights and the stories they've been covering. As the crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border continues, there's growing concern about whether potential terrorists might be among those attempting to enter the country. National correspondent Kayla Gaskins, tell us what Congress might be doing about that. Uh, so, Steve, this concern prompted Texas Congressman Roger Williams, a Republican, to introduce a new bill on Capitol Hill that would require every migrant entering the U.S. illegally to go through a federal screening process where they're screened against the federal terror watch list, and that would help determine if they are or are, are not on that watch list. But that concern comes from the fact that two Hundred known or suspected terrorists have already been caught trying to enter the country, Steve, this year alone. Earlier this month, Border Patrol actually arrested a Lebanese national uh, who was apprehended crossing the border. And while he was undergoing a medical examination, he reportedly told the medical staff he was a member of Hezbollah and he came to the United States to build a bomb. Well, he's now facing charges and he did reportedly, once he was pressed on the issue, retract his statement and, and said he was just joking. But this is not something that U.S. officials, that border officials find as a joking matter, especially as this is the third consecutive year that Border Patrol is on track to surpass two million migrant encounters. And that's not in counting the known uh, gotaways. There's more than 140,000 known gotaways, and that's what the chief of U.S. Border Patrol says keeps him up at night. Steve, these issues are why uh, the House voted to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas over these problems. We're learning that Speaker Mike Johnson is now sending those articles of impeachment over to Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. That reportedly will happen when they get back from their current recess on April 10th. And thousands of border crossers have been sent to sanctuary cities and states around the U.S. You've been covering the ballooning costs of government benefits for these migrants. Kayla, what have you discovered? Well, Steve, it's getting very expensive. These uh, migrants that are coming over, they need shelter, they need health care, they need education, they need child supplies, those sorts of things. And, and the bill just keeps getting higher and higher and higher. New York City has now unveiled this program. It's a pilot program that will reportedly cost the city $53 million. And what they're doing is they're giving debit cards to the migrants. Now, this is a controversial program, but the leaders of New York want to be very clear that this is not a handout. These are not ATM cards. The cards can only be used for food, for food, excuse me, and for uh, baby supplies. So uh, that's their, uh, that's how they're explaining that program. And they're also pressing the state government for more money. Governor Kathy Hochul has already requested the state legislators as they, as they craft this next budget for $2.4 million to deal with the influx of migrants in New York City. That's on top of the nearly $2 billion the state's already sent. New York City alone, Steve, projects that by next summer, the summer of 2025, they will have spent more than $10 billion dealing with this problem. Massachusetts reportedly spends about $75 million each month. That's only on state-run shelters. Denver is going to close free shelters. And there are four shelters, excuse me, and they're expecting to save $60 million by closing those shelters. In Chicago, the leadership won't even say how much they're spending on the migrant crisis. And this is really turning into a political problem for that. Voters in Chicago, very unhappy with this. And they said, if they at a, at a recent city council meeting, if they don't see city, city leadership turn things around, they're gonna change the way they vote. And it's all coming up during a big election year where immigration, uh, according to the polls, is uh, at, at the top, if not the top issue for voters. Meanwhile, turning to the economy, another top issue for voters, gas uh, prices are spiking with some projecting $4 a gallon soon. Janae Bowens, why the spike and what does this mean for Washington's inflation battle? 
Yeah, so gas experts tell me the spike happens every year around this time. Now, there are a few reasons why. First, we're making the transition over to cleaner, more expensive blends of gasoline that the EPA requires for the warmer weather. Refinery production is slowing down to prepare for the summer, and there's an increase in consumer demand as the weather warms up. Now, the fears of getting to $4 a gallon could be a reality if there is an unexpected hurricane, refinery issue, or more issues in the Middle East. Now, the higher prices could force the Federal Reserve to delay cutting interest rates, hurting their plans to lower inflation. And rising gas prices in the middle of a tight presidential campaign, not something President Joe Biden wants to be facing as he battles slumping approval ratings. An economist YouGov poll out this week shows 60% of Americans disapprove of Biden's handling of inflation. Steve. Right, another issue that could um, uh, have an effect at the ballot box this November. Janae, Kayla, great reporting. Thank you both for your hard work. Back to you. Still ahead, caught on camera, a disturbing incident out of California. New reports of a human body part stolen after a deadly train crash. Plus, shopper safety concerns over repeated violent crimes at a Maryland mall, where the entire community is on high alert. This is the National Desk America's News Now. We have reporters all across the country in your neighborhoods covering issues that matter to you. From a crackdown on aggressive drivers in Florida to Maryland residents fed up with violent crime, we're taking the pulse of America. But we start with a disturbing case in California where police say a man stole a human leg from a train crash. I'm not sure from where, but he came this way. And he walked all through here, and he was waving a like some person's leg. And well, he was he started chewing on it over there. He was biting it, and then he was hitting it against the wall and everything. And it was a typical Friday for the construction workers laying down concrete outside the Amtrak station in Wasco, until they saw a horrifying sight. He's eating it. Hey, la está comiendo. You are looking at what a witness says is a man eating a detached leg. The detached leg came from a person hit by a train near the Wasco Amtrak station earlier that morning. Well, on the leg, the skin was hanging. You could see the bone. At this moment, investigators haven't said who the leg belongs to or who was hurt in the train crash, but we do know that one person died. <laughs> Inside where the fun starts. I know you've got people tied up. Can anybody break away from whatever they're doing? It's where it all ended Saturday afternoon, just before 2 o'clock. Okay, it's going to be at Macy's, Southwestern of the Coworker, Pocket Knife, Ambo Staging. Baltimore County Police say the male victim was taken to the hospital. You normally don't really hear stories like that. The stabbing, leaving this white mar shopper stunned. It's quite shocking, to say the least. Two cases of violence, adding to a long list of incidents at or near White Marsh Mall. Last year, that's when he was attended to by my manager and the host that we're working up front. A man was shot and taken to the Olive Garden across from the mall. And in 2018, he's got a gun. He's got a gun. He's got a gun. Oh, yeah. Lived in White Marsh for for 20 plus years. For everyone that lives around there, it's quite concerning. <laughs> Driving around Palm Beach County, you'll see people put the pedal to the floor. 
that I'm gonna die or they're gonna die or someone's gonna die. And according to the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office, there were more than 220 vehicle involved fatalities in the area just last year. That's why they're teaming up with the Florida Department of Transportation on a campaign called Target Zero. We're actually aiming towards zero fatalities and crashes on our roadways. The aim is quite ambitious, but we do know that if we actually practice and share ed information, educate the public, we can change driver behavior. Sergeant Scott Yoder says if you want to burn rubber, you can. Just don't do it on public roadways. We were all kids at one time. We like, you know, we like the cars also, but there's, there's a time and place for that, and it's not on the major thoroughfares and major roadways uh, within Palm Beach County. You have to go to a sanctioned event. Still ahead, the stories making headlines next week, from fast approaching elections to a controversial vote on a state abortion law. Looking ahead to stories making headlines next week on Monday, lawmakers in Maine are set to vote on protections for medical workers who perform abortions. Since Roe v. Wade was overturned, 17 states plus Washington, D.C. have passed similar legislation. Tuesday is Election Day in some states, and former President Trump is scheduled for a rally in Green Bay. Trump has already secured enough primary votes to clinch the GOP nomination, but he needs to secure the vote in Wisconsin if he wants to win the general election. Also happening Tuesday, Kansas City residents will vote on a sales tax that would fund a new ballpark for the Royals and renovations at the Chiefs Arrowhead Stadium. The teams have spent a combined $3 million on the election. The nation's largest sports books are coming together to tackle problem gambling. Seven companies, including FanDuel, DraftKings, and Penn Entertainment, are forming the Responsible Online Gaming Association. Members will work together on issues from conscientious marketing to education. An estimated 2 million adults in the U.S. meet the criteria for a severe gambling problem. That'll be all for us on the weekend edition of the National Desk America's News Now. Don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time. Check your local listings. Thanks for watching the weekend edition of the National Desk. I'm Didi Gatton, and from all of us here, have a great week.